Thanks uh, everyone for inviting me. I'm uh, David Brentnell. I'm a specialist musculoskeletal physio and I work with Axis Rehab. Um, today my topic is good practice in acute injury management uh, of work-related MSDs and I'll make special reference to shoulders and neck and back as requested. Um, uh, there's time for questions at the end and you might have some specific cases that we can bring up that are related to those areas of the body. Um, along the way I want to argue four central propositions. The first is that early intervention is the key, that's early access to rehabilitation if required and early return to work. Um, the second point is that good practice needs a team of people with a consistent message. The third is that predictors of poor outcomes are psychosocial rather than being physical. So physical capacity at the beginning of an injury, ability to bend forward and backwards and things like that are not predictive of good return to work and it's the psychosocial factors that are most important. And the fourth is that unnecessary uh, early investigations are, uh, are not helpful and they're associated with poorer outcomes. For the purpose of today, good practice is evidence-based practice and it's that sort of practice that gets the best return to work outcome. An acute injury, and I need your help here, an acute injury is one that A is very painful and in general greater than 5 out of 10 pain, or is it B an injury that occurred between 0 and 6 weeks ago? These? Okay, that's right. So acute injury refers to a time frame. Um, and that's an injury that occurred within the last six weeks. The next period immediately after that is a subacute injury, six weeks to 12 weeks, uh, and then beyond 12 weeks is considered chronic. And this corresponds somewhat to a tissue healing model where in that first zero to 12 weeks, tissues should have healed um, and in the chronic phase, persistent pain problems can be from other factors. But what I'm talking about primarily today is that very early period, zero to six weeks. What's an MSD? It's a musculoskeletal disorder. And for the purpose of today's discussion, I'll be talking about soft tissue injury. So I'm excluding bony injuries and fractures. Um, and when we're considering soft tissue injuries, it's an injury to muscle, joint, ligament, cartilage, disc, tendon, or connective tissues. Any good practice in acute medical and acute rehabilitation management begins with excluding red flags. Has anyone heard of red flags before? So this is excluding illness that's not musculoskeletal in origin. Um, and that can be that it's the source of the problem is uh, an underlying infection or that it's a, a cancer or that it's some other systemic illness. And there's questions and there's examinations that medical people perform. Uh, to exclude that, and but first and foremost, that as part of good practice, that would be done right from the beginning. Okay, soft tissue injuries are caused by two types of um, uh, events. One is a single quick or intense event, and one is a multiple injury event. We might call that an overuse injury or wear and tear type injury, where minor injuries build up over time. Those sorts of injuries that build up over time have early warning signs. These are the early warning signs that many of us ignore. Um, and that can be a feeling of ache, hot, tired, sore, crampy feeling. I'll add the word fatigued feeling. And you may feel this uh, in the shoulder or you may feel it in the back. And that's a precursor of, of these cases that can go on and be an actual injury or in your case, an actual claim. So what's happening? Excessive awkward positions or excessive loading uh, or stretching uh, causes strain to soft tissues and there's not enough time for those soft tissues to recover. Uh, we get a process of fatigue and inflammation and micro tears and then that process goes on to be an actual injury and a claim that we're dealing with. Interestingly, if I go back a slide, within the workers' compensation environment, we're looking to put things in that uh, uh, quick, intense, single in, uh, environment where we're looking for a single lift or a single activity that people were doing when in fact possibly that multiple things that had occurred prior to that one event. And, and a quick example is lifting a box, 
you can lift a box that's five kilograms and you've been doing it all day and then you get a strain as opposed to lifting a 30 kilogram box where the load moves and that would be a, a single event and the other's not. All right, so uh, early intervention. My first proposition was that early intervention is the key, but does the evidence support this? Let's begin with physiotherapy and there'll be discussion around, particularly at mine sites, in terms of access to things like early physiotherapy. Um, that are challenges, but this is what the evidence suggests. Um, in a study that looked at nearly 4,000 cases of acute lower back pain, um, uh, they broke them up into three groups depending on how quickly they had access to physio. The first group had early intervention and they had access to physio within the first 48 hours. The second group was zero to seven days and the third group was after eight days. And you can see the numbers there. You can see that in the first group there were about 1,300 second group 2,000 for that first week and the last group was nearly 500 injuries. And what they found was that the early intervention group, the group that was seen within the first 48 hours, um, was superior to the other two groups, superior to the seen within two to seven days and superior to uh, those seen after eight days. Uh, in terms of they had fewer doctor's visits, they had fewer restricted work days, fewer restricted work days as, as well as fewer lost days um, and they had shorter case duration. In another, another study performed by Linton, uh, in this particular case they broke them up into two groups, those seen within three days and those seen after seven days and there was obviously a gap period where they, they didn't consider those so it was either early intervention or it was considered somewhat later intervention. And what they found was that those that were seen within the first three days had about a 2% chance of having persistent symptoms when uh, at a chronic phase, which we all now know is at 12 weeks. Um, so there was 2% when they were seen earlier. And when it was seen after seven days, um, it was much higher at 15% went on to the chronic phase. They also noted that there was a decrease in the amount of lost time in the early intervention group as well. So early physiotherapy is good, but what's the physiotherapy look like? It's active rehabilitation, it's not just symptom relief, so it's not going into physio and lying in a bed, starting with a hot pack, having a bit of a massage, uh, physio is getting a bit fitter, doing the exercise and patients lying there. <laughs> um, it, there needs to be an active phase of rehabilitation and that starts off small, the active component, and gets bigger very early on. Um, but when there's active rehab, we know that that speeds up return to work and it reduces uh, lost time. Um, in terms of should we be doing hands-on physio at all, combined hands-on physio or manual therapy plus exercise therapy has been shown to be more effective than hands-on therapy alone or exercise therapy alone. Um, and we, we know, now know, and all of you guys know this, that early uh, contact with the health professional and the workplace uh, results in better outcomes. Um, this is one slide in my whole talk, but basically early return to work is the beginning and end of things. If, if you're able to achieve this, lots of other things are going right that I'll talk about today in the background. Doctors are on, on the right page, the physios are on the right page, supervisors and, and the actual worker themselves. But this is the single most, uh, singular most important factor to get a good outcome and ideally the work will remain at work as Matthew alluded to before. All right, my second proposition was that uh, we need a consistent message, we need a team of people with a consistent message and in terms of the people that are involved we have the worker and the top three are the first most important, the, the most important person, the person who uh, is most likely to inf influence a good return to work, a good outcome and return to work. That's the worker. They're number one. The second most important person is the supervisor, and the third most important person is the doctor. If we begin with the worker, they bring with them their previous history of experience with injuries, injuries at work, how quickly they return to work, their view on injuries and return to work, and their view of work and how happy they are with work. Supervisors bring either a positive or negative experience uh, 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 addition to the situation, depending on whether they're supportive and accommodating or whether they're, they're not being helpful. Uh, and the doctor does the same thing. They bring, they, it's well known and there's been lots of studies to show that doctors 
beliefs about return to work and doctors' beliefs about injuries and how injuries recover uh, are passed on to their patients. So hence they're the third most important person. And look, the same applies from physiotherapists. And then there's everyone else. There's family members, neighbours, and Aunt Shirley who strained her back and was told she'd never walk again. Um, I, I had a bit of fun with this next section looking at some, some things that come up in terms of this consistent message. And so we're going to go through some true or false questions here. Um, and okay, so we're focusing on the acute phase of things. True or false? Soft tissue injuries can initially be quite painful and debilitating. True or false? The amount of pain associated with these injuries is a good indicator of the severity of the condition. False. false. True or false? Waiting for all the pain to completely go away before resuming usual activities can improve recovery. False. false. We now know that's absolutely not right. True or false? Identifying a specific tissue which is causing symptoms, for example through scans or x-rays, is all, not always necessary to effectively tr treat an injury. True. True or false? Research shows that resting in bed for about a week can assist with your recovery of acute back pain. False. We now know that actually slows down your recovery. True or false, studies in back pain have shown that bed rest beyond 48 hours can negatively affect, affect recovery. That is true. So 48 hours in big studies is the number. Um, we don't want people to rest in bed for 48 hours. We want them to try and resume normal activity when they can, but that's the tipping point of, of bad. Uh, true or false, early return to work on suitable duties doubles the chance of successful return to work. That is an old study now, but it was a review of many studies, um, and it's still often quoted. True or false, you can diagnose a disc injury from a physical examination. Now this is a harder one, we're getting into the harder ones. So this, uh, this is a do an examination a doctor would do or an examination a physiotherapist would do. Um, and the answer is false, you can't diagnose a disc injury by doing a physical examination, but we hear of it all the time. We hear physios saying you've injured your disc. Um, you, you also have physios saying you've injured your facet joint. Okay. Um, all right. True or false, you cannot return to work until you have a diagnosis. True or false, you cannot start physiotherapy until you have a diagnosis. And this mishmash of other comments, the radiographer said it was the worst rotator cuff tear he'd seen. The physiotherapist said I cannot lift five kilograms until my core is strong. That one, I'm going to bash physios for the next two. Uh, the physio said I will not get better while I remain at work. Um, and look, I've been there. When I was a young physio and people weren't getting better, I said to them, look, because you know you try and half own their problem as a young physio and you're trying to do the right thing and get people better, and when they're not getting better, you start telling them how bad they are as to why it's not your fault that they're not getting better. <laughs> and if, if it's a work-related injury and you start dreaming up all this stuff about discs, you start negatively worrying them. And I've, I did it as a young physio and it still happens. So the physiotherapist said it's my disc and then the worker, I had a lot of pain in my disc yesterday, I get that, or I had a lot of pain in my facet. Um, and so these are all terms that have been told to them and negatively influencing their belief about what's going on. Uh, a supervisor saying don't come back to work till you can do the full job. A worker saying uh, I do lots of independent case review so I'm reviewing cases that aren't going well. Um, uh, Rob called it the other day, uh, an assessment called uh, why is it taking so long assessment. Um, and um, one of the questions I asked them is, why do you think it's taking so long and why don't you think you're getting better? And 30% of, of people will say, I'm not better because I returned to work too early. Now, that's part of their belief system, but they're looking for other people like the physios to jump on board with those sorts of thoughts. And it's a whiplash. Now, a study's been done in motor vehicle accidents, and if people get told that they've got a whiplash versus they've got a neck strain, they do more poorly. They have greater periods of disability, and uh, their outcome is more poor. And the, the reason I bring that up is I've seen injuries in workplaces where one is from a mining site, um, and a guy was sitting in a truck, and a, and a, a loader was, uh, a, a, a digger was loading dirt into the back, and that it was dropped from a larger height, and they got a fright. And uh, someone along the line told this person that, that, it, that it actually was more than an extra and it was a whiplash. Um, and this was a case that they didn't return to work for six months and a real, real disaster. And the same when people slip over, when someone, someone inadvertently says along the pathway that um, oh, you did slip over but you're not getting better because it's a whiplash. All right, 
So my third premise was that uh, psychosocial factors uh, predict uh, poor return to work outcomes and in fact physical factors alone are not predictive of return to work and there's been some study into this area and I thought this might be interesting for those of you in remote uh, and areas and areas with uh, less access to uh, medical care and physiotherapy. Um, but there's some um, biopsychosocial screening tools that can be used to help predict those cases that aren't going to go so well. And one of those is the acute lower back pain screening tool. It's been shown to be 80% accurate when used before physio started, so you can use it before physiotherapy started, 80% accurate in identifying what cases won't return to work by the end of the physiotherapy program. Um, and they were 74% accurate in identifying people that will require more than seven sessions of physiotherapy. So the, the big message here is in terms of your remoteness, if you're looking at spending resources, there are tools that can help you uh, identify people where you can target your resources towards, even before they start physio. My talk's about acute care and good acute management might identify some of these people early on. All right, uh, but the message I want to reiterate is it's not physical fact, it's, it's psychosocial factors that predict that. My fourth and final proposition is that unnecessary uh, early investigations are not helpful and associated with poorer outcomes. This is a new study that was just published in November uh, late last year and it's a review of the literature looking at CT and MRI changes in pain-free individuals. So the following slides are individuals who are asymptomatic uh, in lumbar sp for their lumbar spine conditions. Um, and they looked at lots of different variables, degeneration, disc bulge, disc protrusion, spondylolisthesis, um, facet joint degeneration. I'll show you a couple of graphs with age-related changes in these asymptomatic people. Um, all right, here's the first one, disc degeneration. So I might just pick an age. Let's say 50. There's an 80% chance that if you're a 50-year-old and you're a truck truck driver or anything, um, that you'll have disc degeneration at age 50, okay? These are asymptomatic individuals. Disc bulge, if we choose the age 50 again, there's a 60% chance you'll have a disc bulge, <coughs> asymptomatic. Disc protrusion, uh, if you're 50 year old, it's about a 36% chance you'll have a disc protrusion. And this is unhelpful that we know that these, this population of asymptomatic individuals have these symptoms, then when people have a sore back and they go on and have these sorts of scans, they, they attach their symptoms to these structures that may or may not be true. Uh, facet degeneration, note the slower process in facet degeneration, that's normal, and spondylolisthesis is a little bit slower as well. But present, these are all asymptomatic individuals. So why is that important? Well, in 2010, Webster and others uh, looked into early MRI for acute lower back pain and saw how the outcomes of whether people had an MRI or not uh, influenced uh, their outcome. And they pulled this data out of uh, Work Cover Authority in the USA. Um, they found that uh, of the cases that they saw, and there was over 3,000 cases that they looked at, 21%, um, 21.7 had an MRI, and on average, uh, that was done at the two-week mark. So 21.7%, on average it was done at the two-week mark. Interestingly, um, if, you don't, if, you, if, you, if you do an MRI and someone doesn't get better, what you do is you do another MRI. 18% of those had a repeat MRI. Um, and what the study found was they, they separated the two groups, whether you had an early MRI or whether you hadn't. And uh, what they found that um, now, one of the benefits of the study was there's good numbers, more than 3,000 people. It is an observational study, so we need to be careful about interpreting the results. But what they estimated was that MRI could worsen the severity in terms of disability, uh, the medical costs, and they were at larger risk of going on to having surgery. I was asked to talk about shoulders as well. MRI found 34% of asymptomatic shoulders uh, the, in the Scher study that's uh, reported a lot, uh, had full thickness rotator cuff tears, uh, and Tempelhof um, uh, found that 54% of people over 60 had rotator cuff tears. Now these are full thickness tears, both those studies, um, and for partial thickness tears, the graph sort of looks like some of the other ones we showed before. Um, I found this, so 
they're my key points. Uh, MRI definitely has a role if people have red flags, but one of the uh, one of the studies in particular highlighted that most of the well, the individuals that were going and having these MRIs in general didn't have red flags. Now I found this yesterday. Um, it's from the uh, WorkCover South Australia website, and it sort of summarises. Um, you'll be able to find it yourselves. It summarises some of the key points that I've talked about today. Um, and they break it up into an acronym AIM, which is, starts with uh, ASSESS, um, and it, this is directed towards medical professionals and physiotherapists um, who are providing care in a, that sort of compensable environment. Allow sufficient time in the consultation to discuss um, and identify beliefs, expectations and fears that workers may have, so it's psychosocial things, so do that right from the beginning. These are, these are, this is a direction for acute back pain, I should add, so these are acute cases. The second one, uh, aim to early identify and address factors of influence management. These include red flags and psychosocial yellow flags. Avoid imaging, like we've mentioned, unless there's a red flag. Assess the worker's ability right from the beginning to return to work on suitable duties. Okay, the inform section, inform the worker the pain does not mean it's getting worse. Explain the difference between hurt and harm. Uh, instruct the worker to gradually resume their normal activity despite pain. Bed rest should be discouraged. Inform the worker the majority of cases an, ac an accurate diagnosis is not required and specific low back pain is okay. Inform the worker that regardless of diagnosis, many back pain are treated in a similar way. And the manage and monitor. Um, manage and monitor an early return to work. Uh, uh, managing psychosocial issues, as well as giving advice and education and exercise. Monitor and assess uh, the progress of the worker um, and making structured workplace interventions such as worksite assessments if they're struggling to get back within four weeks, which, depending on where you come from, seems like a long period of time. Okay, now, I sped that up because I started late. Um, we've got time for questions and then if you're struggling, I've got two questions also that were, I had to give a talk on shoulders recently and I've got those. Any questions first? I've got one, I guess it's partly comment, partly question. Um, so as a health professional, you know, the, around the asymptomatic cases and use of imaging and those sorts of things, I agree 100% and that's something that we, we really do try and avoid in our rehab. But having said that, we also then have the, I guess the counterintuitive side of that where from a business perspective we're needing to mitigate risk in terms of our employment practices and those sorts of things and I've had the argument from you know, GM saying why don't we give you know, MRI everyone before they come on site so we can check how their back is you know so I guess you know there's got to be a point in that where it works and, I'm, and Rob, Rob probably knows a fair bit about this doing you know the pre-employment type work that he does but how do we the balancing balance, act. How do we balance that from a risk mitigation perspective when we may have the inspectorate asking questions about what did we do to mitigate the risk of exacerbating a pre existing injury or something like that that comes out? Mm. That balance, where do we, how do we find that? Mm. Rob, do you want to make a comment? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, it is a balance, isn't it? Because uh, we do know that in cross sectional <laughs> data, when you do try and do an intervention, uh, an investigation for your first part of your point, um, it does worsen across the board people's outcomes. But that's still just cross-sectional. So there are individual cases where I think an investigation helps uh, in that person's journey to getting better. But like any investigation, you need to talk to them before they get the result because the radiologists report all sorts of different things. How to manage how to get outcomes on chronicity of back pain, I guess, is my next presentation. How do you stop it um, and uh, what can you do at with a primary, secondary or preventive, uh, tertiary prevention and the, the, the challenges, but I'll put some, for, some ideas for it. It's a little bit of a belief system thing too, I think, because we're looking to assign, as much as our patients are looking to do that, we're looking to assign blame somewhere. Mm. Say, this is the cause of this injury, therefore, am I liable, am I not liable? Mm. Uh, hence the inspector comment. You know, yep. everyone seems to be, I mean, counterintuitive to what you just said, which suggests that a lot of these findings would appear anyway. We're trying to assign blame then. On the exactly. The findings, so yeah. It's not really about recovery at that point. No, that's that's exactly true. Which is, 
don't know, like they've changed, but <laughs> yeah. it's going to be in conflict. I, I might say as an inspector, I, I don't know what industry you're from, but I, I cannot see any um, inspector expecting that you would be doing MRIs in a pre-employment screening program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I was <laughs> no, I haven't heard of any companies. No. Um, so, like I said, I think, um, you know, again, it's, I can only speak on behalf of the Mines Inspectorate. Um, and we, we do have um, our, our medical um, advisor as well, but I, I, I cannot see that it would be an expectation that pre employments include MRIs. I, I imagine you weren't actually proposing no, that, were you? No, no, no. <laughs> absolutely not proposing that. <laughs> Just but I guess degree. in terms of, <laughs> you know, an expectation, yeah. you know, and, and that's our aim is to make sure that we're not putting people at risk. We don't want to employ people and put them in a role where they're at risk. And then, so, and if we do, and inadvertently there was something that we were not aware of, you know, it's right to place scrutiny on the processes that we've put in place to try and identify and mitigate that. Um, and so it's, it's, my comment is about where finding that balance as an industry. So I work for BMA. So as a as a business, it's about us trying to find that that point where how, how many questions can we ask? Do we want to ask? And is it appropriate to ask to balance that? So we're not putting people at risk and to demonstrate we are you know actively seeking to mitigate. Yeah. Mm. Is there any other questions? On that point of the asymptomatic discs and rotator cuff tears, has it been studied to suggest how many of these became symptomatic? No, I don't think they've followed them up. No. Yeah. yeah. I guess sometimes it is a precursor to injury down the track. And, um, yeah, that's just yeah, it's one of those challenging medical questions, answering those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do, yeah, we don't know. The two questions quickly that were asked of me when I was talking about shoulders recently. Um, these were questions that were just emailed through to me and I just cut and pasted them in. Uh, common mistakes by physios regarding treatment for impingement um, and what workplace rehab practitioners need to watch for. Um, and the second one was physiotherapy view on uh, things to look for uh, in regard to the function of the shoulder to determine where, whether they're ready to progress with load and elevation. So if we do that in the context of an acute injury um, the biggest thing that I see missed and when I'm reviewing cases is A, the obvious thing that there actually there's no re rehab occurring in, in the process and it's, it's a very passive approach to physiotherapy. Um, and sometimes when exercises are occurring, what's happening is it's ignoring the, the intended function of the shoulder. And the intended function of the shoulder is that you can do this and you can lift things above your head, right? And what we see is we see lots of rehab occurring in zero degrees shoulder elevation, which, um, and shoulder rehab is angle dependent, so your ability to strengthen doing stuff up here has to occur up here. And we see lots of rehab that occurs down low, and it doesn't transition towards, you know, mimicking some of these work tasks that people have to do, overhead tasks. Um, and then this, that sort of leads into the second part of the question. If you're doing rehab in those sorts of angles, it's really easy to know exactly what they're at in terms of managing load for, from a return to work point of view. Um, that's my little bugbear on shoulder rehab. It all happens down here and shoulders are designed to do things up top. And that's my time. Thanks. <laughs>